Hey everybody, this is Flavio Romeo, and on this episode of the Towncast, we had the chance to talk to Joe Connor. He co-authored a book called Shattered Lives with Jeff Ingber. Uh, Shattered Lives is a, it's about the story of Joe's father, Frank, who was killed uh, in the bombings back in 1975, the bombing down in, uh, in Lower Manhattan at Francis Tavern, uh, killed four people. So he shares his journey from growing up with, with that pain uh, and everything that happened in between to when all of, the, all of the terrorists were released from prison. It's an incredible story. Uh, they turned it into a movie. The movie is going to premiere at the Hawthorne Theater in Hawthorne, New Jersey on January 25th at 6 p.m. Go to ShatteredLivesMovie.com for more information. And we're going to have a book signing at Shortways Barn on February 18th from 3 to 5. You get a chance to meet both of the authors and, uh, and hear, hear their story and uh, talk a little bit more about their book. All right. Enjoy the episode, everybody. So here we are. We're, we're in the home of Joe Connor. Thank you so much for opening up your home. Oh, this is, God, not this at is all. amazing. And, and it, uh, I, I know a lot of you local people know Joe. If you don't know Joe, Joe is the co-writer with Jeff Ing Ingber. Ingber. I, I almost want to say Ing. Ing I don't even know <laughs> Ingber. I N G B E R. But he's the the co-writer of the book called Shattered Lives. Uh, it's available on Amazon, and. When I started, when I started looking into the story, I'd heard about it, uh, and then I, I talked to Joe briefly, and I started looking into the history of the story, and it's just, it's insane. I mean, it really is crazy that what happened. But let, yeah. let's go back. So, sure. Uh, wh where did you grow up? I grew up in Fairland. Oh, what part of Fairland? Um, I'm right on Saddle River Road by uh, by Beaver Dam Park. We. I grew up in Beaver Dam Park. Oh, nice. Like Heinz Dairy used to be over there. I think it's Oceano's now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you able? To, were you able to get some of the Nabisco smell? Did it reach you? We did. You know, just on the right. <laughs> you know, at the right, when the wind was when the right. Wind, when the clouds were down, uh, the wind, the was, wind was right, east. man. Yeah, 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 yeah That's yeah. the one thing that, that you know. They now that they've closed that, it really takes away. Like my daughter wrote in the school thing about she grew up in a town where. It smells like cookies every once in a while. It's, it's, it's dream. It sounds like heaven. It's, doesn't my it? daughter said the same thing. It's, yeah, it's pretty dreamy. <laughs> Uh, so you, you grew up and, and you were born you were born and raised there pretty much. Yeah, right? yeah, I was born in Teaneck and grew up in Fairlawn. And you had an older brother. I have an older brother, Tom. Yep. And by the way, we're recording this on your birthday, Tom. So happy birthday. <laughs> Shout him out. Well happy done, birthday. Tom. And then your birthday's coming up too. So yeah, yeah. Happy yeah, birthday. On the 20th, yeah. Happy birthday to you Thank as you. well. So Thank this you. is this is coming out on the sixteenth, so it's gonna be your birthday. Uh, and, and I mean, it was. Tell me a little bit about growing up with your brother. Your brothers are close in age, right? Yeah, I mean, he's two years older, and you know, like other old brothers, we played and we fought, and we, you know, we went down the park all the time. He had tons of friends. We were always outside. I mean, I, I, it was like a great childhood. Like, like I said, we were at Beaver Dam Park, and we played every game known to man down there. And like most kids, my generation, I was born in '66. We uh, you know got on our bikes in the morning and you didn't know, come home until, no one knew until it was dark. Where the hell we went? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No cell phones. No, no cell phones. Nothing. And we made it. We did. How and did we make it? At six fifteen at night, there would be a siren go off in Fairlawn. I remember my yeah, mom yeah. would be like, "All right, guys, when you hear that, start coming home." Like, all right. We had the same thing in Hawthorne. <laughs> it was we had the pump house. You have the six, six o'clock. Yeah, right. It was like, oh, go you gotta go now. Because if it was summertime, it's still light. It was still light. It's, yeah. Winter time is dark. Yeah, we just never come home and. Um, it was great, and uh, you know we still we still have so many good friends yeah. from uh, from those days, and uh, you know I wouldn't trade that part of my childhood for anything. Yeah. And then, so here you are, you you're growing up, and you're you're having fun, and and January twenty fourth, nineteen seventy five. Yeah. And and I, I you know just from reading it, it I'm gonna get emotional because it's I, I can't even imagine that. Talk about you, you got up like every other morning. Yeah. It was a Friday. It was a Friday. It was middle of winter, but it was really nice, like 40s maybe, but it was sunny and kind of a crisp day. You know, the, 
I just remember things because I knew at that time I had to remember or else yeah, I'd forget, yeah. right? So I remember that morning like every other and um, you know, my dad went to work. He worked at the Morgan Bank in the city. Um, that was down, down on Wall Street? Downtown, yeah. yeah. And he was, uh, he was only 33 years old, right? I mean, you had kids oh, younger you guys back young. then. Yeah, so ridiculous. <laughs> uh, and that was a GoPro glitch for some reason. It, it just shut off, so I apologize for that. All right, so so yeah. Chris morning, yeah, Friday the twenty fourth. Friday the twenty fourth. I like we just said, Tom had turned eleven on the thirteenth. I had turned uh, nine on the twentieth, and my mom. It was a Friday. My dad was going to work. You know, he was a young guy, and he was going to be coming home, and we were going to celebrate celebrate our birthdays that night and together. Together, yeah, just have a dinner. Did you do that every year? Yeah, you know, the family would eat, would have together, and we'd have a birthday party with kids in the basement. And nice. I think I had had my birthday party in the basement already, um, you know, with all the kids and pin the hand on the dog. You know, yeah, it yeah, wasn't yeah. like today, right? So yeah. it was just very, you know. And uh, so anyway, that was going to be like, a, you know, just the family, us, the four of us and the dog. And, um, you know, he never came home that night, and you know the the details of it were, were horrendous, and what we what we had to. Um, How did you cope? I mean, now now obviously with the internet, everybody knows in seconds. Yeah, it was different. I mean, it, we had gone to school like always, and um, come home, uh, we wrestled, right? So I mean, I was I had just turned nine, but I was in third grade, and Fairlawn had a really good wrestling team, and I was just, that was my first year wrestling. My brother was in his third year, and he was really good. Um, but uh, we had practice that night. But um, so we would go out, we'd come home, and then we'd like run out for like an hour to play, and then we'd come back and go to wrestling practice. Like that's kind of right. like. So we went out, we came home, we went out to the park, and uh, my mom comes to the park, which was very unusual, and called us home. And um, you know, it was kind of weird, no, right? What, yeah. what did we do? What did we do, right? <laughs> right. You know, so. so um, you know, I, I, I can't remember exactly how she told us, but she told us that there was an explosion in uh, Wall Street area and... Security guard. That happens. Security guard in the house. Yeah. That's what happens when you do things at home. Um, <laughs> anyway, so... That's okay. That's okay. I'll right. pick it up. Not a problem. So, she, she brings us home and... Um, she said there, was, there had been an explosion downtown. She had heard it on the radio during the course of the day. She was making lasagna for dinner that night. You know, she was born in Ireland, but she made really good lasagna, <laughs> inexplicably. So, um, you know, while she was cooking, she she had seen on the radio, or heard on the radio that there had been an explosion downtown. So she called him and she said, "Hey, Frank, the guy phone gets picked up." And she's like, "Hey, Frank, thank God it's you. I was afraid, you know, you might have been there." And um, he's like. It was one of his co-workers and said that no, this isn't Frank and she said she said he was there wasn't he like she immediately oh. knew she yeah. she felt like she had premonitions over Christmas that year that something wasn't going to go right this is and this was at Franz, Francis Tavern. it was at Francis Tavern and it was a place where the guy where, where they did go but she you know my mom will say like my dad didn't wear like one of his better suits that day so she didn't expect that he would see clients because you know everyone wore suits back then but um, it, she didn't think he was going out for lunch. She didn't know right, he was. Right. But she kind of got the feeling immediately that he was there. And, and the guy on the phone said, uh, yeah, that he, was, he had been there. And so I think, you know, she kind of knew... Of course, my wife calls it. She kind of knew intuitively that, some, that he was there. And um, so she called us home. We didn't go to wrestling practice, obviously. And a group... People started coming from the bank. And... Um, you know, but no one, no one knew anything. And I remember thinking as a nine-year-old, my father was indestructible, right? And, you know, he was probably under rubble or wood or boards or something. And, that, you know, he'd be okay, right? And, um, you know, then my Uncle Don, um, he, he was my dad's first cousin. They were both only children. They grew up in Washington Heights together. But I called him uncle. He was really a good cousin. But um, he came over and he actually, I think one of, he or one of my dad's friends from the local area went and got my grandmother. My grandmother Connor, you know, had come from Ireland in the early 1920s. She had one son very late in her life, and that was my dad, in 1941. Oh. And uh, oh, he was really the oh, yeah, only child. child. And uh, of all the people. So, you know, I think she suffered the most 
Um, but we, uh, you know, we found out when the guys came that you know he he was dead, and I kind of remember. I mean, I was I was small. I was about less than fifty pounds, and I remember like cause I knew that weight. I know that because I wrestled. Cause you, you, and you, know, and you know, you know, weight when you wrestled. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was like literally leaning over one of the guy's shoulders, kind of flailing, and um, you know, I remember that night. And we went to bed in my in the bed with my mom and uh, and my brother and the dog, and I remember asking my mom, "Is Grandma still our grandmother?" I guess a good question for a nine year old. Yeah. And uh, and she said, of course, she's always going to be, you know, and that was good. Like my mom set the tone right then. And I got to say, my mom was so good to my grandmother. She lived till right after 9-11. She lived uh, to almost 98 years old. Your grandmother? Old. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, That's she awesome. was awesome. She was the best, literally the best person I'll ever meet in my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Ugh. so, you know, that was, that was hard. It was hard on everybody, but, you know, we did our best. And I think Tom and I, we, we kind of focused on sports and I guess school we did okay in school but we did better in sports and we were good wrestlers and um, weren't great he was better than me <laughs> <laughs> but you always had True. that that, you said that role model ahead of you. yeah exactly so, uh, so it must have really bonded you guys even it, it did it did and we uh, you know we, we did our best and my, my grandmother always said like I don't want the boys raised with hate and uh, you know let's We'll get through the, you know, do the best we can, but never ever forget either. And, yeah. you know, and that was been the point of this whole thing for me is like never forget my dad because he really deserved a lot better than being murdered. And also, then you'll find out later all the political things that happened, uh, you know, 15, you know, 20 years later. Yeah. So, so the group comes out, they were called the FALN. Uh, it was a Puerto Rican group, yep. right? And it was a Puerto Rican terrorist group that was. At that time, they were kind of notorious for setting bombs across the country. <clears throat> well, yeah, they, they had they started their first bombs in uh, in um, November, December, to, um, 1974. So this was their second major attack. Their first one was they, uh, they set a bomb in, I think it was Harlem, and they called the police. And when Orf Officer Pogi, who was Puerto Rican, and his first day on the job, oh. shows up, there was a booby trap for him. And it blew up. He didn't get. He wasn't killed, but um, it real, you know, ruined his life in a lot of ways. Wow. So, and he was Puerto Rican. And then their their next big bomb was the Francis attack. And um, you know that that was a. You know, I've learned a lot. And w what they did, you know, Francis is where George Washington um, bade farewell to his officers after the Revolutionary War. Was that right? Yeah. At, at that time. Francis. Yeah. That's been around that long. Yeah. It's the oldest. It's the oldest building in New York. Wow. Um, it took a cannonball during the Revolutionary War. It's where the Sons of Liberty met. Um, so it's a, uh, it, it, probably the FALN themselves didn't appreciate that, but they were very connected with other terror groups of the time, such as the Weather Underground. And some of my FBI friends believe the Weather Underground chose the, chose the, the location. The location. Wow. So I mean, just as to just finish the story up from that day, my father had gone to work in the morning, like we had said, and um, he did have a, he went out with clients uh, and they went to Francis. They, they wanted to eat in the in Morgan building. They had a nice uh, cafeteria or a nice dining room, but the, it was booked. So they went to Francis and when they got there, they moved tables. So this is the, this is why terrorism is, for lack of a better word, uh, it works because it's inexplicable, it's, it's random. I mean, they went and they moved tables. So they set themselves in front of a, where a man walked in with a knapsack, set it down on a, there was a staircase in the, in the uh, restaurant. He set it down on the staircase, walked away. It was moved by one of the waiters who kind of pushed it out of the way, but the explosion happened within minutes. Mm -hmm. It was filled with 12 sticks of dynamite and uh, anti-personnel shrapnel like nails. And, that kind of thing it was really meant to kill a lot of people, and it was a very busy place. So Francis, was, uh, when, oh, I'll just finish. When the bomb went, it, uh, my dad, I believe, was killed instantly, um, as well as uh, two other men at the table, and then one man upstairs, Howard Howard uh, Harold Sherborne, um, was killed by a projectile going through the through, through the, ceiling. the ceiling and piercing him from below. Oh. 
yeah, this was no, this was no joke. And the cops at the time were a lot of them were Vietnam vets, you know, if you can appreciate that. And they, a lot of them said they'd never seen anything like this. Yeah, even coming back from Vietnam. Yeah, it was vicious. It was, it was intentional. It was. Yeah, they they meant to kill. They people. meant to kill a lot of people. Yeah. And the fact that only four, and they say only, um, it, it could have killed a lot more. Yeah. And yeah, sixty were right around lunch. Sixty were wounded. Packed. Right. It's a packed. packed packed restaurant. Yeah, and it was where, you know, they they left to communicate. So I mean, it looks like, you know, it sounds like something out of a Superman movie or, some, but they do they did leave communiques and. They talked about reactionary corporate executives, and you know, this was in retaliation for something the CIA had done on, uh, in Puerto Rico. But it was all BS. I mean, the, the FALN, they were Marxists, and they were trained by Cuban intelligence. Uh, they were, they went on to rob um, armored cars and things, and a lot of the money went ended up in Cuba. Really? Yeah. So they they were, and and if you look at their literature. Um, they looked at Puerto Rico and Cuba as two wings of the same dove or something like that, and whatever phrase they used it. And so they were never looking to free Puerto Rico like they claimed from America. They were looking to subjugate the Puerto Rican people right. um, under another Cuban regime. Yeah, yeah. So, so my dad really, in, that, in essence, was a victim of the Cold War. I mean, he was, it was Castro-sponsored. And um, so, you know, when you think about, like we always said, oh, you know, the Cold War never really hit us but it did, yeah, and, yeah. and, and he was definitely he was definitely on the front lines. We didn't know it really at the time, but um, yeah, when it, when you kind of boil it down, that's that's what it was. Did they did they catch the guys? Did they? <laughs> yeah, um, they did in several several ways. Um, they uh, they caught most of them in Evansville, Illinois. Um, they were going to rob a. Northwestern University. It's kind of unclear what they're doing. Was it Evanston? Evanston, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Evanston. So um, they were like in the back of a van and uh, people saw them in, in disguises. I mean, it was some, like I said, it was something like out of a novel. And uh, they called the police and they were really heavily armed. The police would have been completely outgunned. But the FALN thought they could kind of um, talk their way out of this. Uh, but they were arrested. They were they were brought to trial in Illinois. They were they wouldn't um, testify at their own trials because they they claimed the U.S. had no jurisdiction over them. At sentencing, uh, they did speak, and they some of them threatened to kill Judge McMillan, who carried six shooters under his robe. Uh, really? Yeah, these guys were no joke. They were, they were, these guys were no joke. They were very disciplined. They kept meticulous records they left no fingerprints they would hold things with between their fingers like this rather than like this so yeah, yeah. so they left no fingerprints um they were they were really trained in spycraft where when the fbi was onto them they would they could would surveil them going the wrong way on on uh, on the l or the um the subways to circle back and then change their clothes and they were you know they they were they were pros. They're very pro. Yeah, they're yeah. very, wow. very professional. To, to the point that um, one of them, a guy named um, William Morales, was not arrested in Chicago with the rest of them. He was arrested on uh, July 12th, 1978, which would have been my dad's 37th birthday, wow. when a bomb he was building exploded in his Queen's bomb factory. It blew off nine of his fingers, one of his eyes, and... Uh, when the cops got there, he had turned on the gas in the, in the um, apartment building and was, picture a man with no finger, shredding documents and trying to flush them down the toilet. He turned on the gas to blow up the building. He was turning wow. it into a bomb. Um, so, so dedicated to what he was doing that he had the wherewithal to, after, a horrific explosion like that to shred evidence and and um, and try to blow up the building to kill the cops. I mean, that's it. That's just it. that's his sole focus. It doesn't. It, you that's don't get this any, guy, right? That's that guy. That's yes. this guy on the cover. Yeah, he's in Cuba cover. now. Look at this guy. Yep. Yeah, he's been a guest of the uh, first de Castro regime and, uh, and now and now been in Cuba for uh, since the nineteen eighties. So he escaped from prison with no. Excuse me. With one thumb, mm. escaped from prison. Yeah. What What happened was he was uh, the 
he went to, he was sentenced, he was tried. He was sentenced to 89 years in New York, New York, and 10 years federal. He was allowed to go to Bellevue Hospital to be fitted for a prosthetic device because he had no fingers. And while he was there, he, was get, he would get his, his lawyer would come, and uh, the story is that she would come regularly and wasn't bathing um, to the point where she was smelling horrendously. And when at that point, the guard stopped frisking her. And when she realized that, she put, wow. this is the story, she, she put a wire cutter um, under her clothes, smuggled it into him. And one night, uh, he cut through the, the grating, because he wasn't in a prison cell, he was at a hospital prison, right, right, so it was a little right. bit different, and shimmied down a rope made of sheets. He, it, somehow he fell, he hit, a, he hit an air conditioner, broke his ribs or damaged himself somehow, but he was spirited away by, um, by the same people who broke Joanne Chesimard out of prison in New Jersey. Um, and uh, that was the uh, group called The Family. And they were like uh, Susan Rosenberg's and that they were kind of Weather Underground and May 19th Communist Organization people that kind of had a, a group. And they uh, nursed him back to health in, in um, Newark, I believe. Might be wrong about where, but he, long story short, he ends up in Mexico. Um, the FBI got a tip that he was in Mexico um, Somehow the Federales went in after him. There was a gunfight because he had supporters with him. A couple of Mexican cops were killed. He was sentenced to prison in Mexico. And they, in 1988, 89, they extradited him to Cuba against Ronald Reagan's wishes. Wow. Reagan was trying to get him back here to serve his sentence. So one of the focuses of the movie and what I've been going through for the last thousand years, it feels like, is to get uh, Morales returned from Cuba. And the, just this past year, we got a bill um, between Marco Rubio and uh, Robert Menendez called the Officer, <laughs> the Officer Warner Forster Frank Connor Justice Act, um, calling for Cuba to return uh, fugitives, because there's, there's many. Um, but it, my dad got his name, finally got some recognition for who he was wow. uh, on the thing. And so, that's part of the story. We haven't even gotten into the political part yet, with the clemencies and that. So, so, so there's a movie based on this, based on the book Shattered Lives. They produced a movie. It's going to be screening next Wednesday. It's going to be screening January 25th, right? Which is yeah. the day after. Was it 40? In 48 years. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's the day after the event happened. Uh, it's going to be screening at the Hawthorne Theater. What time is it gonna? It's the doors open at six. The movie starts at seven. It, it, you know, it'll be an event. We'll have um, we'll have the movie. We'll have uh, Q and A and uh, beer and wine. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna be there. Answer yeah. questions. I'll be there brother. to answer questions. My my brother won't. He has a work event to go to. My mom will be there. Will she really? Yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. good. Yeah, she's eighty four now. But she's sorry, ma. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you look like you're seven. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So she'll be there, and my wife, and um, you know, my my. My, my my daughter will be there. My son won't be. Will be there. So you know, I was looking. I was looking up the uh, the story of of uh, Oscar. Was it Oscar? Oscar Lopez. Lopez. And, Rivera. Yeah. And who was the? I guess he was. He was the head of it, right? Was he yeah, he was one of the FAA leaders. Yeah, yeah. And you know, here's here's a guy who tried to break out of Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. He tried to escape out of Leavenworth. Tried to escape out of another prison. Yeah. And. You know, he was he was trying to amass all of this this firepower in prison. In prison, yeah. And the FBI, you know, tapped in on that, and he was trying to get explosives, um, it guns, ammunition, ammunition, yeah, and and a helicopter. I mean, this is something out of a movie. I mean, it's, truly, it's, yeah. So when we went to face him at his parole hearing in Terre Haute, um, one of the, what uh, year was that? That was two thousand eleven. So you you actually he was up for parole. Mm -hmm. And is this the first time you saw him face to face? Yeah. yeah. What yeah. did that feel like? It was, I, there was nothing in my life that could prepare me for that. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, so, so nothing. Right? So we flew out, my brother and me, and um, a woman whose husband was killed at, at the table, Dini, and uh, Bill, who was at the table with my dad, and an FBI agent all went out to Terrell, Indiana one night for, 
to go to the parole hearing the next morning. And like we we went to like a, I don't know, some bar, and we're just kind of sitting in there and we're like talking about like, what is this going to be like? Yeah. Like you know, what do you do? Like so th there's really nothing that prepared us for that. Yeah. Um, so one of the few times I was actually I was kind of nervous and I haven't been like that much during this because I've been kind of focused on what I'm doing, but. That was a weird one, and showing up at the prison that day, and it's all, it looked like an old fortress from you know the medieval times, and, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, going over a moat and through all the security and stuff. And the security guard says, um, "You guys know what to do, right?" And I'm looking at him like the closest I got to this is Shawshank Redemption. I don't even know right. what you're talking about. <laughs> right. So, so, so they bring us through, and Oscar comes in, he's shackled up. But Don Wolford, one of the FBI, the FBI agent who came, he had gone to see the warden the day before, and the warden wasn't planning on him being shackled at all and Wolford was like you, yeah. what he's like you got th these guys have tried to get him out of prison twice with machine guns and explosives yeah. and helicopters he better damn well be shackled up so he was um, but you know they sits down at a little in front of a little Ikea table and in a in like a prison cafeteria it was a strange and at the time it was like 65 70 years old right? yeah maybe something like that yeah, yeah i forget exactly how old. yeah, yeah so, you, so you're you're seeing him through glass or you were in the same no, room, the same room. Just, just the same room almost as close as i am to you right now yeah it was, it was oh, bizarre I can't, I can't even imagine what that was yeah. it was it on the one hand he wanted to lunge and and, and and grab him on the other hand he was pathetic you know he lied like you know, yeah, I was found with explosives in my uh, in my apartment. But I don't know how they got there. Yeah, I went underground for years. And uh, well, why'd you do that? Well, I found the FBI was after me. Okay. Well, why was the FBI? Like, you know, this was all in the parole. Hearing. This was all, all during the parole hearing. You know, he had been in Vietnam and apparently won a Bronze Star, and he was criticizing the American soldiers for what they had done to these Vietnamese civilians. And. Uh, you know, I pointed out that then he came back to the U.S. and he did exactly to the same American thing. civilians that he accused of. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly the same thing. I mean, they blew up 130 bombs in the U.S. and this was this was they were devastating. Not all of them ended up with deaths, but it was terror. It literally was terror. And you know, 1970s were bizarre in that way. There was a lot. There was of these a lot. Groups. There was a lot. Yeah, yeah there was a lot. Yeah. And so here you are, you're 2011, you're at the parole here. What, 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 what was the outcome of the hearing? The outcome of the hearing was that uh, they recommended against his parole. Um, we did the right thing. And, you know, as we walked out of the, the prison, the guard said, when the guard says, yeah, you guys did great, he's a piece of shit anyway. And I was like, yep. Um, but yeah. but the, I was a little shocked that, that we won. <laughs> and he was, he, he was uh, you know, remanded to, to stay in prison for at least another 10 years or something, maybe 15, could have been to 2025, but it didn't matter because, um, you know, we didn't even get into the, the first Clinton clemencies yet, but, but the, uh, he ended up getting a clemency from, from um, uh, Obama in his last day in office, second clemency. His last day in office, yes. he gave he grants this, this guy, guy clemency. this guy. No, no, that's Morales. So we're talking about Lopez. Lopez. Yeah, Lopez. He, he grants Oscar Lopez clemency. Yeah. Now, we didn't even talk about it in 1999 when uh, Hillary Clinton was running for senator. You see, the story, it's hard to go linear with the story because it takes you in a lot of different directions. But, but when Hillary was running for, for senator from New York, right, in 99, she was going to be facing Giuliani. And so it was, it was a pretty big deal. Like, yeah. Giuliani was well known. And... Uh, at that time, we started hearing rumors that they were trying to give clemency to the FALN terrorists. And were they still active at that time? No, they were they were in jail. They they'd all been they all been they'd all been put away. As soon as they were put away, the bombing stopped. Yeah, like, yeah. Interesting how that yeah happens. shocking, right? Um, so so we started hearing that after they'd been put away, basically in 1981, a couple were a little after that. Like Lopez was arrested separately from the rest of the group, but but. Um, they were all basically for life. And we started hearing incl inklings that they were going to offer them clemency. I thought it was impossible. And, Why? Well, because they were trying to connect Hillary with the Latino community in New York, which is such garbage because the, in, in, on so many levels, because they, they were claiming the FALN was not violent. Now, the FALN <laughs> was never convicted of the Francis bombing that killed my dad. They were never tried for it because they were put away for basically life in Chicago. And they were all, they, so they were never tried for this particular. They were never tried for the Francis bombing. The 
they were put away for 70 years, you know, maybe on average in Chicago. And the, the economics of law enforcement at the time, and really now, um, is why bother? Why bother? Right. There and was no death penalty. The there the was law. no death penalty in either state, and there was no money to start bringing them back and having a trial where you would have needed major security to go through the same crap that yeah. they had just gone through in Chicago. So there was no way they were going to do that. And just as an aside, just a few years ago, I found a picture of. I know it's Oscar Lopez outside Francis right after the bombings, and it was it was in the Daily News, and I saw it, and it's him. Uh, we did some facial recognition, and really, yeah, it's in the book, yeah. But anyway, wow. so this guy claiming know nothing about anything, yeah. Anyway, so but you know, as a as a member, they were all put away for a seditious conspiracy, and um, as a member of the conspiracy, you're responsible for all acts of that conspiracy. So whether they right. whether they were specifically um, convicted of the Francis bombing, they were all part of the conspiracy that, that, that did that. I mean, they had communiques claiming it. I mean, it was, they were all part of the same, uh, they, they, they did it. And, yeah, yeah. and the, you know, um, the FBI agents and law enforcement you know, were just appalled when Clinton granted them clemency. So it was, let's go back to August 1999. Um, it was summer, Congress was at a session. I remember my kids were really little and my brother's kids here. We were at Vance on Park. <clears throat> Came back and my sister in law called and said that they just announced the FAL and been given clemency. It was like August, it was like August 15th, 1999. Wow. And uh, so we were like, all right, what do we do? Right, so we started writing. You know, there was no real internet the way there is now, where they, you know, there, it was just very different. So we did an article in the Wall Street Journal. Started doing some talk shows. I was on um, Laura Ingram and um, let's see, a bunch of different. We did a bunch of different shows. But what happened was the FLN didn't accept the clemency. Um, they said no. They never asked for it, and they were, it was hoisted upon them. By so, the so Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Gave them clemency and they said, no, 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 we want to stay in yeah, jail. Yeah, Bill gave them clemency to help Hillary with, connect with the... And they said, no, 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 we they want said to stay no. in jail. So it was Eric Holder was the deputy attorney general at the time. Um, Clinton had gone to Holder earlier that year and asked him to give him some, you know, some background that would allow, that, that would look okay for him to give clemency. Because Clinton, while, while the clemency grant by a president is absolute, it's one of the few absolute powers of a president. Right, once they say it, it's done. Yes. It, it, it's like declassifying information. The president can do that anytime. Clemency can happen. There need not be any background for that. And we tried to put a bill forward called the Pardon Attorney Reform and Integrity Act, and it got shot down because constitutionally it didn't stand up. The president has right. absolute power on clemency. So anyway, but he wanted some, he wanted something in writing or someone to give him some background. So when he did get called on, he could say, well, look, I got recommendations here that says it's okay, so right. politically he'd be okay. So he, he gets Eric Holder to do that. So Eric Holder goes to Margaret Love, and she was the um, pardon attorney at the time, and he said, I want you to recommend the release, and she said no, so he fired her. So um, then he brought in um, Christian Adams, and um, same thing, and he asked Christian Adams, and Adams, says, Adams wouldn't recommend it either. So Adams wrote an options memo that gave it didn't go, it didn't recommend anything. It just said, here are your choices. One was release, one was like um, not release, and one was sort of a hybrid. It was like, but anyway, it was kind of a BS type memo that he put together, and Clinton used that as his, as his kind of ammunition to, to offer these guys clemency. So they turned it down. For 30 days, they're given conference calls between prisons. Now, clemency is an individual grant, it's not a group grant, but yet these terrorists are allowed to talk between prisons and decide whether they're going to do it. Finally, on September 10th, 1999, they accept the clemency of all but Oscar Lopez, and Oscar stays in prison. The rest of them walk out of jail on September 11th, 1999, significant day, and Just everyone's gone. There. Just that's it. That's it. They're out. And some of them went to Puerto Rico. They, there were some conditions on it. They were not. They were supposed to renounce violence as a uh, political tool, which Lopez wouldn't do. Um, and they were supposed to dis disassociate themselves with other felons, which would include each other, which they probably never followed. Yeah. That. So you're taking, you're taking these you're terrorists, terrorists at their word. word. Exactly. Oh, I promise I won't do I, that. I promise I won't, oh, I won't, no I won't commit violence anymore. Yeah. I'm a terrorist. But, but just listen to me. I'm, I'm honest. I'm yeah. telling you. So uh, 
so yeah, so so they're on. Finally, they left prison, and um, it, you know it's crazy because two years to the day after that, it was September tenth, two thousand one. Excuse me. I wanted to start writing about what happened with my dad and the clemencies and all this. So I got a I had a doctor's appointment that night, a doctor in Fairlawn. And uh, I left work early. I had my laptop and uh, got on the train. And I was like, oh, I'm on an early train. My cousin Steve, he was a bond trader at Kenner Fitzgerald, and like, he's gonna have beers. He's gonna make me drink. I have a doctor's <laughs> appointment. It's probably not a good idea to have beers before the doctor's appointment. Plus, I want to write. Yeah. So I purposely sat in a car where I wouldn't see him. Right, right, right. And I, you know, wrote two or three paragraphs of crap, and. Uh, the next day, you know, I got back, I got to work. I was plugging in my laptop when the uh, side of the North Tower exploded. And I watched the people jumping. And you were right down there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we were there and I saw the both planes hit. And, uh, um, and then, you know, I tried to call Steve and um, got his voicemail. And I was like, you know, he said he was the Tower One. I commuted every day for 13 years so I didn't know which one was Tower 1 or Tower right, 2 right, right. so I'm like Shalette you alright like you know give me a call back so ended up in long story short again my brother and I met on the street and we um, we ended up getting home that, that night and I drove his car home from the train state he lives in Franklin Lakes and we went up to his house and kind of like what all the guys from work came to my our house when my father was murdered um we were at his house with all these people yeah. mulling around. And then Steve's wife, Tomiko, had said, uh, you know, could you guys go get his car? So uh, we drove down to Radburn, the same station my dad parked in. Right. Wow. It was his godfather. Oh, that'd be surreal. And I drove his oh. car home. And Steve was a lot taller than me, so I was like driving, like leaning back like this. I didn't want to touch anything. I'm yeah, like, this yeah, is his yeah. car. And I left News Radio 88 was on, and, um, you know, I kind of leaned back, and there was no one on the road. It was one of those. Uh, and people at the, at the house were all kind of thinking, oh, you know, maybe he's okay. You know, maybe we just didn't hear from him yet. But like, you know, I was there. We yeah, knew, you saw We it. knew it wasn't okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Canna Fitzgerald just got decimated. Decimated. Destroyed. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it, it, you know, so we, we, then we saw the, the difference between how we were treated, you know, how after 9-11 we went to war um, against the terrorists in the case of my dad. We, least them. So it was a pretty big difference in the way that in the I mean that must the, that must sting the most just it does. You know it, it you is know is there is there a way that they can be brought back to trial for that case? Has well, it been too long? No, or? The answer is murder, there is no statute of limitations. Right. So the the picture of Lopez puts him at the scene. Um but you know talk I've talked to law enforcement about it and like well you know, one picture is not, not going to get a conviction it's not enough uh, you know I, you know so I, you know our, our goal right now is to get Morales returned from Cuba um, to finish his finish his sentence 99 years at his age probably wouldn't be that long but but also even if we can't get Lopez tried um, I'd like some recognition from you know I'd like my dad to get some recognition I think part I think part of it is that we got the bill in his name um, yeah. for the return from Cuba, which was big. I mean, he deserved that. Um, but it's and, almost like the the government just never just never even acknowledged that that and, happened. And that that's what really hurts a lot. Like yeah, and you know, after Steve was killed, you know, it, we all rallied, right? And yeah, the government yeah. rallied, and and I think that was the right thing to do. So you know, this is not any any way sour grapes. I'm a 9/11 family member too, but in my in my father's case, we never even got a phone call. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, no one picked a up. a terrorist act. Right. We, like, the, our congressman domestic, never domestic, called. Domestic terrorist. Domestic yeah. terrorist act. Yeah. Like, I mean, no one was calling that... my mom and saying, you know, I'm sorry. or we never, yeah, right. As a matter of fact, one of the guys, um, they tried to, he wanted his suit reimbursed from the bank, and they didn't want to pay for his suit. That got shredded by a bomb while he was working wow. there. So it tells you how different the world was. So, you know, wow. we, we were left to ourselves. And maybe that's you know, it's not the worst thing either. But um, I would like some recognition. 
All right, so we ran out of battery, so I replaced the battery. We're going to finish the story, I'm telling you. It's, I mean, you know, in, in talking to Joe, there's, there's so many aspects of it. I really recommend that you guys pick up the book. Uh, it's available on Amazon. It's called Shattered Lives. And, and you go into, you go into everything. Into we do. Like, and the thing about it is, like I said, I started writing it. And I couldn't put my head around this. You could, hear, you could see how fragmented the story is. It's all so, over, yeah. yeah. So, so much. So Jeff, Jeff is terrific. He's very patient, too. You know, he, he really was great putting it all together. And he also made it balanced. He, go, he talks about the United States, what, how we treated Puerto Rico over the years as a colony. And uh, we didn't treat them well, yeah. right? And, uh, yeah. you know, I agree. And, you know, but, but the solution wasn't murdering innocent people. Right, right. right. And, and right. you know, and the FALN, too, the precursors to them, they shot up the Capitol building. They, they, you know, so they've been at this a long time. Yeah. And this has been a, you know, a, um, it's been a, they viewed it as a war. And we didn't, so many, right? That's yeah, kind of yeah. what's happened with this. Well, the movie's going to be January 25th. At six o'clock, doors open at six. Movie starts at seven. There's going to be a Q and A afterwards, yep. uh, where you'll get a chance to talk to Joe, get a chance to talk to the director uh, about the about the story, about the movie, and and we're gonna watch we're gonna watch a trailer. We're gonna watch a clip of the uh, the movie now. So so hang on, and and you'll see what we're talking about. Look, I've carried this on my shoulders since I was nine years old. We F A L N, the Armed Forces of the Puerto Rican Nation take full responsibility for the specially detonated bomb that exploded today at Francis Tavern. And at that point, I knew what forever meant. It was one of the most extraordinary prison breaks of the 1970s, made all the more so by virtue of the fact that this man only had his left thumb on his hands. His left eye was destroyed. My father deserved better than that. You know, he was a better person than any of these politicians could ever be. You can't imagine what terrorism does to a family. It has a fallout in every aspect of your life, and I don't want anyone to have to ever deal with it. You can only give forgiveness for people who ask for it. You see, after 9-11, we went to war to stop the terrorists that murdered Steve. After my father was murdered, we let them out. It's an incredible story. I mean, just even just, did it, what did it bring up for you? I mean, well, going through it, it's almost like reliving it again. Well, that, yeah. And, you know, especially like when the clemencies were offered in 99 and then again with Lopez, it just brought up, the, it just brought it up again. And, you know, they, it, it, I remember saying like, it hurt to think that the president's political agenda was worth more than my father's life. Right. That's and that, that's part. kind of what it boiled down yeah. to. Well, if they're given, they're given, and I remember, you know, the clemencies were non-violent clemencies. Right. So we're going to release guys that got caught for smoking pot. But this was a different set of clemencies. These, these were specifically on the FALN. Like these ones. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like I saw the listing. Okay. And there's a lot of public information. You can, you know, if you look up uh, Oscar Lopez, what was his last name? Oscar Rivera. Rivera. Oscar Lopez Rivera. You know, I found the whole court transcript. Of, you had you had the FBI agents that came and were petitioning. Not to have him released. Right. You had you had you know all the law, the, the president of the fraternal the order of police, order of police yeah. officers, Gilbert Gallegos. Uh, we had every everyone was recommending against his release. So, you know, I, I testified in '99 in front of the Senate Judiciary about their release, and you know, here's a, I, you know, I realize I'm so stupid um, that uh, I'm trying to keep these guys in prison during that 30 day period where they would right. go, and then they're out, and now I'm like. And now what? Nothing, now nothing. I got terrorists out, and I'm trying to keep them in. That, right. That's not good. Yeah. So I was talking to some of the, excuse me, the retired FBI agents, and, and I was testifying at, at, about it in D.C. And I said to one of them, a bunch of them, one of them responded to me. I said, "Well, should I be nervous? And I have a little, I have a young family. Like, nervous about what?" I said, "Nervous about the terrorists coming after me." And they're like, "Oh no, don't worry, worry about the terrorists. They won't touch you. Worry about the Clintons." And I was like, and he wasn't joking. And I was like, all right, um, that's really bad. Because, I mean, I was testifying wow. about Bill Clinton's release and Hillary's involvement, and, um, and he said it with a straight face. So I did look under my car for a long time. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. Uh, so, 
But my brakes work, everybody, in case anything happens. But um, yeah, so and, you know, then then I got to testify against Eric at Eric Holder's Senate confirmation hearing about his involvement in this too, again. And uh, you know, so it's really frustrating, you know, like I said at the time, you know, anyone that would release terrorists, murderers, who didn't repent, like, it's not like they said, I'm sorry, none of that, right? They didn't even accept it. Anyone who would push terrorists out of jail for politics would pretty much do anything. Right, yeah. I mean, it, I said I said Holder was playing Russian roulette with the American people because he was pushing terrorists out of jail, um, not knowing what they might do. So the mo the movie again is going to be on January twenty fifth. Doors open at six o'clock. People can order tickets ahead of time, right? Yes, please. There's a website. It's um, um, w um, shatteredlivesmovie dot com. Shatteredlivesmovie dot com, and there's tickets. It's very easy. Just a couple of clicks. Um, you know, I think I think it would really be helpful. I think you know, if the story's great, um, I want to see. I haven't seen the final cut of the movie myself, so I'm uh, I'm I'm really excited to see it, and I think everyone's gonna really feel like um, you know, there's lessons to be learned, right? Like, it's that sometimes you gotta fight for what you think is the right thing, and you always gotta be prepared for that fight. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, you've been fighting this a long time. I have, and it's, it is exhausting. Just yeah. Ask my wife. Um, it, you know, it's it's a lot, and you know, at some point, James Rosen, who's in the movie, he's a reporter, he used to be at Fox, and now I think he's at Newsmax. But he had asked me like, when is enough? Like, your dad would be proud of you. Can't you just give it up? And um, yes and no. You know, it, it it can be exhausting, but it also at the same time, when you feel like you have a just cause. Um, it's kind of worth it. Yeah. Um, but you know, when it when it does hurt my family, then then that you know that that's an issue too. Yeah. Well, your mom's got to be proud of you. My mom's very. Yeah. She's good. She's 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 tough. Is she gonna bring any lasagnas? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'll tell you. When I wrestled, then I was more afraid to go home after a loss than my opponent. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we you know, She's tough, but she's great. She's awesome. Shattered ShatteredLivesMovie.com is where you can get the tickets. The tickets are gonna include the Q&A afterwards, gonna include the reception. You'll get a chance beer to- Beer and wine. Beer and wine, you'll get a chance to uh, to talk to the filmmaker, talk to to Joe, and, yeah. and uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, continue fighting, because I, you. I can't even imagine, you know, losing, losing a family member, let alone your dad, any family member, um, and, and, and just watching these guys just walk free. It, it, it's, yeah, it, it's soul crushing, and it, and for the uh, for the um, law enforcement who dedicated their lives, so so many right. of these guys and, spent yeah. decades, and their marriages broke up. They, you know, I mean, like they give everything to it, and 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 they get these guys in jail, and then they're told, man, eh, they weren't violent anyway. They can go. Yeah, they can like go. It, 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 what does that do to the morale of of yeah. people? It kills them, you know. Uh, Joe, I, I really appreciate you anytime reliving this again. Well, thank you for thank you for talking to me, and, and it, 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 I like the way you do it. It's very calm and um, uh, friendly, so I really appreciate it. Well, that. and my heart goes out to you and, and your brother and your mom and, and all your family members. Well, thanks. That had to live through this. Yeah, we, we like to say, you know, my dad was a victim. We're not because we can fight back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Hey, and we're going to see you on the twenty fifth. Yes. Right? Shatteredlivesmovie.com. I'm going to run through this before it sh shuts off again. <laughs> and listen. You know, go on Amazon, pick up Shattered Lives, the book. It's by Joe Connor and Jeff Wingber. Ingber. 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 I can't say it. Jeff Ingber. Yeah, there's a picture of him on the back. Yeah. Jeff Ingber. Uh, and, and it goes, I'm sure, like, like every book, it goes into a lot more detail than you're going to see in the movie. Sure. The movie's 80, 90 minutes. Right. Uh, so the book will give you all the information. And, and get into a lot of the specifics of, of the clemencies, both clemencies. Both. These guys, clemencies twice. Yeah. The one guy said no. No, he turned it down. He turned it down. He turned and then, it down and, and he, he gets another one. Anyway. Yeah. And then he's made a freedom hero of the Puerto Rican dick. So, so <laughs> come, come support Joe and his family on uh, January 25th at 6 o'clock. And, uh, and we'll see you at the Hawthorne Theater. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thanks again. Anytime. Really Take Thank care, you. man. All right. Be well, everybody.